of issues. And I was thinking about the program, reading the abstracts, and I'm sorry the whole sessions meant that we couldn't all hear everything, but getting a feel for what's been going on. And, and I was struck by a number of issues that maybe can broaden things out through a discussion that we can all um, participate in. Um, one of the issues was the title of the conference itself, which was very interesting. Um, music on the stage. On the stage. The conference was Rufin. Um, music on the stage. A very specific title. I'm sure you, you chose it. No, it's not opera. No. Very specifically not opera, but music on the stage. And the diversity that that, that title has prompted has been very interesting because we've moved around and through opera and musical theatre in quite striking ways that, to some extent, encourage relationships and to some extent also emphasize differences. And that was one area I thought we might think about discussing. What does that mean, music on the stage, and how does genre play into that in various ways? Um, the second issue that struck me was how non-canonic we all are at the moment. Has that, has that struck you? I mean, a lot of the works we've been talking about in wonderful ways are, are, are not the standard mainstream canonic operatic repertory. Um, uh, and even when we've headed into the canon with the end floor or what we have left or something, we've gone into somewhat different directions with the canon. And, and I, that's clearly a good thing. I mean, escaping the canon, as far as we're concerned, is, is a good thing. Approaching the canon in new ways is a good thing. But I also wonder whether there isn't a kind of um, abnegation of responsibility on our parts in some kind of way. Do, do we feel there's nothing more to say about the canon? You know, whether it's Handel, whether it's Mozart, whether it's Rossini, whether it's Verdi, whether it's Donizetti, whether it's even Wagner. Do, do we feel that everything's been done and therefore we start moving outside of the canon um, in, in, in these ways, uh, in various ways? Um, the third point I wanted to, to, to bring up was music the stage, or music on the stage, and how we've engaged with music I think has been very interesting as well. I mean, we've had some papers that have gone into very deep technical discussion of the music dominance here, tonics there, you know, leading tones going up and down and all the rest of it. So traditional music analysis and relating that in very powerful and effective ways to drama. Um, and other people have taken a somewhat um, less analytical in that technical sense approach to music. So when we're talking about music on the stage, what are the different ways we can go about thinking about how music works and how a technical analysis might or might not connect with the dramatic issues and the musical dramatic issues that we all care about. So those, those were the three issues that, that struck me reading through the abstracts and hearing papers. This question of music on the stage, not opera, but musical theatre in general, what that means. Um, the whole question of um, musical analysis uh, and the question of the canon and where our work sits in relation to any kind of canon. And I don't know if that kind of throws out enough points for people to respond to, think about. I don't know what my colleagues think about any or all of those issues or other issues. That well, I think it's very interesting. Um, in terms of the canon, when we began, there was very much canon focused papers. And over the years, we've pulled away from that. And I don't think that's necessarily because we feel everything's been said. I think it's much more um, people having been steeped in the canon, able then to apply and see it in a broader field, which I think is, is a good thing. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. But um, I might. I, I might developing here is a very successful way of talking interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So we've got a wide range of people coming to this conference. It's not just the analysts, even though people are turning out analysts for materials. Um, we've got lighting designers, we've got practitioners, a lot of practitioners, fantastic number of practitioners, who are bringing in a wealth of experiences. And often they're forging their own means to that practice using less conventional methods because there is no convention for that kind of thing. I think we might head back there. Mm -hmm. I get the sense that we'll head back mm -hmm. as we evolve the vocabulary with which to do so. <coughs> yeah, well, no, I, I think, think it's, it's a really well. 
I mean, that, that's, that's reflected in the various sort of slight emphases we've had over the years, that sometimes it's been a more performative practice than, um, than the canon. Sometimes, like this time, it's been slightly more biased to opera than before, but that is why music on stage was chosen, so that it would stay wide and bring together, the hope was that it would bring practical elements together with the academic elements, the analytical elements, and actually show that, that we're all um, doing the same thing, just from slightly different foci. But, you know, we're, we're not disparate little separate caves that should never be to go. Maybe as a veteran of this conference, yes. uh, <laughs> I want to say that uh, it was exactly the openness of, of this title, Music on Stage, that attracted me uh, to come here six years ago. And I then gave a paper here, not about opera, and uh, not even about music theatre, but uh, about a piece of music and the intrinsic theatricality of this piece of music. It was Jörg Kurtzak's Kafka Pregnant. Uh, and uh, this is a spe special case because we, we, we might speak of uh, theatricality without intention. Well, it's not in just a very little bit of the theatricality is intended by Kurzak, and this piece has developed since the uh, late 80s, 1980s, till now to a piece uh, several uh, directors have staged as, uh, as music theater. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them, especially Peter Sellers, uh, starting point was uh, exactly the intrinsic th uh, theatricality of the music and not of the text by Kafka. Uh, and um, this also can be music theater. Uh, uh, and who is the composer? George Kurtak. He is a Hungarian composer who is uh, in the so called new music scene internationally known composer. And turned 90 years old this spring. And, uh, and he's, he's writing an opera. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. <laughs> yes. uh, if he completes it. If he completes it, yes. Because uh, <laughs> his, his close friend and collaborator, Andras Wilhelm, who is something like an assistant of him, he does several uh, other things too, and uh, teaches at the Music Academy in Budapest. But she, uh, he, he, whenever I ask him about Kurtak's uh, opera, uh, the, the libretto is uh, Endgame by Beckett. Uh, whenever I ask him about the state of the opera of Kurtak, he, he says uh, no, he, he won't complete it, he won't complete it. <coughs> And it's, it's, it's commissioned for Budapest? Or? No, 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 it was commissioned for uh, the Salzburg Festival several years ago. But he didn't complete it in time. And he didn't complete it yet. And he's over 90. So he will be decomposed. Well, the other thing that comes out of what Jane was saying is, you know, we're, we're, we tend on our, on, you know, in our institutions to sit in our various silos, um, but we don't want to sit in a silo. We want to reach out, we want to be interdisciplinary, we want to be cross-disciplinary. How, how does that work nationally versus internationally? Because one of the great things about this conference is that we have a, a, a very strong international representation. Okay, so we have, you know, we guests from Poland, from Germany, from Hungary, and so on. So we are, um, and we are, in a sense, trying to be more global in the way we think about music on the stage. But does that actually work? Or do we have to each have our national biases, our national approaches that tend to militate against a kind of internationalism? That's why I asked the question about Kurt Hagen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of it. If you're talking about productions, it's so I think it's still very nationally market driven. Uh -huh. You will find an audience in one place for a certain in Berlin for a certain kind of small operatic boutique production. You try and transplant that to any, any city in the US. And if we go 
going to either find an audience or not find an audience, but there's definitely a different kind of audience if you can locate it, stage it, and present it. That's an interesting question. On the one hand, there is um, there's strong associations which cut down international barriers. direction, uh, Jennifer Walsh's uh, opera Die Taktik uh, was commissioned and produced in Stuttgart, Stuttgart Opera House, I think. Uh, and she's Irish and she studied in America, and, uh, but she has strong connections to the German uh, contemporary music scene. So there, there, there is ex exchange on several levels. or a, a shared production that had been seen elsewhere? Um, um, they're, all, they're new every time. Yeah, but the Lost My Way is new every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of schools make their way around. Because <laughs> they're the really outdated now. Do the, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge generalisation pattern, but do the more radical works find a, a, a more ready audience in, 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 set in Europe? I'm thinking about it's like uh, Howard Barker does find himself recognised him. He prefers Europe. Uh, his work uh, in Europe, because it gets, uh, they, they, they understand it, they're more open to it than, than British audiences. Could it be, I just simplified it with, um, to... Well, no, so I was going to say that the examples we've got um, are really isolated ones. And, you know, they come across and they do a single performance and then that's it. Um, It could well be that market forces dictate as market forces dictate what we do in a concert. You know, it's the same work over and over. Don't they guarantee that people will come to see it? Um, well, we were talking at, at, at lunch about how Wicked is Wicked, um, the musical Wicked, mm -hmm. um, in that if I go to see Wicked in Hong Kong or 
in Singapore or in Melbourne or in New York or in Los Angeles or in, you know, for all I know, Taipei, <laughs> I see the same thing. Uh, I mean, it may have different performers, it may be in a different language, but the production will be the production of Wicked. And there's got to be the descending ball that comes down at a particular point, and you know, the, 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 and everything has to be, is clearly branded. I have to see the thing called Wicked. And it has to be the same thing, wherever I am. Um, and it, that's one case where market forces are working in a very clear direction, because you, know, you expect to see Wicked. And any new production of Wicked is not going to be Wicked anymore. It might be Wicked, but it's not, it's not the show. Um, and this kind of branding is very common within um, Broadway musical theatre and West End musical theatre, where, and it starts with, I guess it starts with Lloyd, well, it starts with Ross and Hammerstein, I think, actually. But it's certainly true with Lloyd Webber, you know, um, or the, the mega musicals. Um, I should give Lady Zerab as an example. It was a 25th anniversary concert thing here at the Albert Hall. They had something like 25 Jean Valjeans from different countries, yep. singing, uh, singing the song of and in Polish and Dutch. Japanese yeah. and they all paraded with their national flags. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same. It's the same performance, as it were. Yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there, are, there are variations, but it's the same. But performance. not there's not much variation. Although there's the Beauty and the Beast, mm. the, um, the um, aria, Beast aria at the end of the first half, and they were just going to cut it because the audience they discovered from the US. But this is when she arrived in London. The audience they discovered didn't know the aria because it wasn't in the animated film. And the audience was, you know, under this height, you know, it won't be to 20-stick, and under, under that was your audience. And, and the cast and crew were up and arms and said, we're not doing the show without the Ari, and so they, that went the Ari, which is beautiful, fantastic Ari. Um, but no, they wanted to end with, you know, dancing teacups or something. Um, and, and it was actually up to the car, it was revolutionary. It was literally people turning around and saying, we're not doing it, it doesn't hang together as a piece. And the cast and crew were involved in that, in its reinstatement. But um, it was a it was a power, as Barbara said, it's not. Um, Sonia, you have your hand up. Yeah, as far as I know, it's actually true for some Gilbert and Sullivan works as well. I think up to the 90s, they had to follow Gilbert's stage directions quite quite um, directly. So that was a huge problem because there weren't any new staging. Oh, it's the same as the ban on Parsifal productions for, um, until it was actually copyright after Barbara's death. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the same because it meant you couldn't see Parsifal anywhere else. But if they had allowed it, it would have had to have been identical. It's like you know, the, the rule that you've got to have a black cast before being best. Because the estate says so. Well, the Rochester and Hammerstein organization is terrified about what will happen when R and H go off the copyright. Because at the moment, the Rochester and Hammerstein organization is strictly, do they do the same thing? They strictly control the production. You know, there's only one way you can do a Oklahoma. And you cannot do Oklahoma set in Mars or on the moon. Or you can't do an updated production. You, you, it's not allowed, basically. So every time you do Oklahoma, it's the same. Every time you do Carousel, it's the same. And once they go out of copyright, the Ross and Hammerstein Foundation is, is, is very concerned about what might happen to their properties at that point. Not just because they lose royalties, but also because someone's going to come along and, and, and stage Oklahoma in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a bit difficult to stage Oklahoma in Kansas because you've got the Oklahoma song at the end. Um, but what happens when you have stage directions of the survey? I mean, La Boheme is a, is, is a perfect example. It's very hard to ship La Boheme out of its mm -hmm. time and place because the stage directions are so, so precise and are matched to orchestral gestures. <laughs> you know, the, the orchestral gestures mean that you move from here to there and you ain't got a lot of choice at that point. Yeah. Flying Dutchman also has very specific stage directions, which people very happily ignore, even though they're connected to the music. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because actually what we're talking about is interpretation. But inter interpretations don't travel internationally, but shows with, uh, with encapsulated shows that can only be shown in one way or are only shown in one way, they travel universally, which is an interesting And, and anything film is not takes you back to Lost Highway, when you've got a film, you've got an opera based on a film. If you, if you tie up the scene, this is so geeky of me, if you tie up the scene divisions, and this is a piece that is live vocals, obviously, but a lot of electronica, if you, if you, tie, if you time the editing in the film with the amount of time it's supposed to take for the duration of the first five or six scenes, it's almost as if it was taken from the film. Incredibly difficult to put on stage, 
still about three seconds to do a shift from a bedroom to an outside. You know, it's very, very hard to actually put up on the stage. But we're talking about an audience that will come and see Lost Highway because of the film, who may never have been to an opera before, and certainly never to a 21st century one. They may not feel that they've been to an opera when they have seen it. In this instance, I would agree. For many the, people, that they go away having seen it. It's a totally different experience. It's very, and it's a very different kind of piece as well. I mean, the, the way it holds together is very, very, very um, filmic. Um, but requires some really stamina on the part of the actors. Uh, yeah. Last night we went to see Merchant Blues, uh, the Empire, which came from the Armel Opera Festival, touted as a radical production, and it was basically set in an insane asylum, and you can pretty much put any opera in an insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> if your intention is it to, to finally make sense. You know, so it didn't actually strike many people as, as a particularly original idea. It was very nice. Um, so, and that was an example, perhaps, of a, of a European production coming here as that production, and that would be interesting. And that's the way in which it was marketed. Um, and then it really sort of fell short of expectation. I think you know, it could have been a lot more. I find stage directions a really interesting issue, though. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with switching the setting of a production. That's fine. I mean, if you want to put it on the moon, that's fine. When it, but when it comes to stage directions, that are so closely linked to um, mimetic gestures within the music. What happens at that point? I mean, if, if, if the music is there, you know, you, you, you sprinkle drops of water on Mimi's forehead as she's dying, you know, and they tinkle, 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 the drops of water are in the orchestration. Well, if you decide not to sprinkle drops of water on Mimi's forehead, what, what happens at that point? I mean, the music doesn't work. So, okay, Mimi can be in a, in, 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 out of Mongolia for our care, but you still need the drops of water. <laughs> what if you substitute the drops of water for a lighting effect? Rain on the window, or you know, a spin effect, or... Okay. Does it count? No, I just wonder if that yeah, counts yeah. in... But you something know. needs to happen <laughs> yeah, yeah. that coordinates with the Because we've then got the, the additional problem of the editorial stage direction, you know, written by a 16-year-old trainee from recording at the turn of the century, who was in the front row, and their job was to mark up the score with what happened on stage. K Press though gets published, everybody thinks that it was written by the composer, which it wasn't at all, it was written by the 16 year olds. Um, so we're, you know, I remember being taught um, to go through the score and get a marker pen and remove every stage direction. As part, as part of the process, take it away, not important, you've got to create something organically from what you're getting from it, which might be, I hear tinkly water, let's have tinkly water. That director would have been the writer. Yes, it would have been a writer director. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so it would have been directing, but it wasn't relevant. But if we we might, that's maybe maybe we can. Yeah. Or the French court, it must be the choreographer or yeah. the fact. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the in the 17th century, it was normally the poet, and in the 18th century, I mean, Lorenzo de Ponte was the director of the Nocini Figaro, and it's fairly clear that Lorenzo de Ponte stood on the stage in rehearsal and said. You stand there, you stand there, you go there, you do this. And it wasn't anarchy, as it were. So, no, but once we've separated out these functions, we allow the directors to I'm arguing. Well, the problem there is. 
is that that's because you're repeating old repertory over and over again, so the only way to make it new is by a new direction. But that, that's a kind of um, uh, a repertory issue within, within and, opera. That is also scenographic in terms of, of light here. As soon as we had electric light that we could focus in any one particular direction, you can say, stand up stage left and we'll put a light on you, rather than, you know, kick the board and we might see you. Um, yeah, and so that's the whole, I mean, which coincided. Is there any, this is a slightly side issue, is there any significance in the development of the role of the director that until about 20 or so years ago in the English-speaking world, at least in England, they didn't call themselves directors, they called themselves producers. If you look at old opera programs, I mean not that old, producer David Papp, producer whoever. Until, until I would say until the 80s, yeah. really recently, yeah. I think we've just stolen it from America. Just to save on confusion, because producer there means the person with money yeah. who trumps it. So and it's I think not just follow, and, and my assumption to that, because I wondered that too, my assumption to that must be that we followed that just for the purposes of, you know, bottom line. But yes, as I was a producer, it's a very different kind of person. Well, I assume it also comes from film as well. You know, the, the, the notion of a direct, the auteur director comes from a kind of film. Being conducted who wanted to control, uh, for example, uh, Herbert von Kalia, who used to uh, direct the operas he conducted. But I think Herbert is. <laughs> That's another question. And uh, not long ago, uh, Nicolas Anancourt did uh, something similar with one Mozart opera. The one Mozart opera he bought, he he can only uh, put on stage in a way he is uh, he will be um, lucky with uh, when he uh, directs it himself together with his son, and he did it in uh, Graz in Austria uh, in in his festival. Yeah. That's just uh, uh, but but it got it, there are not many conductors who want to direct. I think they are. I think they are lucky if they don't have to. What uh, what 
what happens on the stage. Right? It's enough to, to conduct well, the and music. And the process as well. I mean, the director the, is, you know, you're in a meeting, you've got to talk to collaboratively with so many different people, yeah. and the conductor has other things they've got, up to 80 people in a pit that they've got to, <coughs> yeah, yeah, other things to worry to about what's happened with lighting and sound keys. Mm -hmm. and but there's also, I think, an increasing divorce between what the conductor does and what the director does mm -hmm. that's accentuated with so-called historically informed performance. Um, because you've got the um, Emmanuel Hines, you've got the John Elliott Gardners, you've got these people who are, are really concerned with period performance, what we used to call authentic, authentic performance. Then we got rid of the word authentic because we don't want people anymore. So now we just call it authentic. <laughs> Um, so, we're, so we're all hip now, historically informed performance. Yeah. Okay, so you get the, we're all hip, we get the harpsichord in the pit, we get the Baroque violins, um, we get the, 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 the nice you know, the 18th century oboes and clarinets and all the rest of it. And, and the music is done with impeccable historicism. Now whether one approves of that or not is another issue. But the music is being done with impeccable historicism. And yet anything and anything can go on the stage. So you've got Peter Sellers, who does a Giulio Cesare, with a, with a, with a fabulous, fabulous pit band. Um, and yet, you know, it's the president of the United States doing this, and the, the, the unnamed Middle mid 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 Eastern state doing that. Now, it's, don't get me wrong, I love the Peter Sellers production of Giulio Cesare in Egypt. It's a wonderful production. But there's a real mismatch between what the musicians are doing in the pit, and to some degree on the stage as well, um, and what the director is, is doing. And there's a real sense of, well, okay, we, we have to be hip, when it comes to the music, but we certainly do not have to be hip when it comes to the staging. We, we can do whatever we want with the staging. So there's a real um, divorce going on between the visual and the song. And, and I find that quite interesting as a phenomenon in the modern opera house. Uh, because hip is becoming more and more required now. More and more required. You would never ever do a Raymond Leppard in Cornhouse on a deep pair. Well, actually, some places still do, but you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't. It would, it would be regarded as a terrible mistake <laughs> to do that. Um, but changing the setting of the pair, well, that's fine. But and sometimes if you do do something that is supposed to be hip on stage, which I see occasionally, it looks to us very strange because we're not used to it. All these odd gestures and... Mm. And was Imeneo, Gershina, and it was here. And in the pitch, it was brilliant. On stage, it was supposedly you know, designed on Baroque models and costumes and so on, but it looked very odd. It sounded good. Mm. Mm. So, why do we want to be hit in one area, but we don't care about being hit? Well, perhaps it's just a question of getting used to it. But we're not going to get the opportunity of getting used to it on stage much in terms of production style. There isn't enough demand. But then when you do a Metropolitan Ring with the horn hat, everybody just thought it was terrible. It, it's interesting, isn't it? If, if what, what they'll accept is quote unquote hit <laughs> on stage and what they won't. And yeah, it's a question of also what we're used to. Mm. And you know, the fact that now Handel Opera has to have endless movement during a dark alpha aria, even if we get a dark alpha aria. Mm -hmm. But during an aria, we can't listen to the music. We've got to see people dancing and jumping up and down and mm -hmm. running up and down the stairs. You know, where does that come from? Does that come from the audience not wanting or able to listen to the music? Or is it from the director who says, well, you know, we can't have stasis. So it's a very interesting combination as to, to what will be accepted visually and compared to what we accept morally. Uh, can I just mention, you You played a clip from the film of Farinelli, uh, and I've seen that film, although I've got a fairly vague memory of it, but as I remember it, they did actually try and do authentic hip staging in that. Uh, and of course, in a, in a cinema film, you could, you know, you wouldn't get away with putting it on six times on Covent Garden stage, but maybe if we want to find out how it might have been, it would be easier for a film version of uh, Handel Opera to give us the real experience, and then maybe we would <laughs> we would discover whether we like it or whether we want to stick with it being set in you know American modern times. 
Um, I think we also have to. Put, sorry, if I jump. Oh, that's, I just wanted to throw in really briefly that um, I think, at least speaking to the American tradition, hip kind of becomes less relevant after 1750. After 1750, if you don't put a concept on it, then nobody wants to come see it, as, as you're saying. And so it's, it's more of the purity, the, where, where, um, the authenticity and the purity movement pre, you know, Baroque and before seems to be more of a thing. And then after that, it's all about marketing. For some reason, for some reason it's, very, it's very exotic for audiences to see things in their original, in their original historically informed um, you know, circumstances than they are otherwise. Because I think things that are Mozart, Mozart and beyond we consider, the, or the general public considers as, you know, stuffy, et cetera, and it has to be, it has to be revived with some kind of, it has to get an injection of some sort of hot concepts, you know, so that's... that's well, the, the danger with hipness, of course, is be, it becomes the kind of the fakery of the heritage industry, you know, ye, ye only tea shoppy. Um, <laughs> the is ye, and shoppy is two p's and an e at the end. Uh, and it's like going to you know, Colonial Williamsburg or whatever, you, know, you kind of you know, yeah. have the authentic experience, but you don't want to go to the bathrooms there because they're a bit smelly. Um, so, um, and, and we've all, you know, her the heritage industry is a very powerful one. In, in, in. Although I'm not sure I agree with you about the, the, the hitness. I mean, I mean, now, you know, Brahms, it's, it's up to Brahms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the, with, as far as, oh, oh, where it, where it ends. Shoot. Where the hip ends. It's up, it's up to Brahms now. I mean, you know, I you, you, there's all sorts of ways in which man, performing a Brahms symphony now, if you don't do it in a hip, reasonably, in some kind of accommodation to hipness, mm -hmm. you have a bit of a problem. So it's not just you know, pre Mozart anymore. It certainly started out like that. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of medieval Renaissance Baroque um, fad um, because no one loved the music otherwise. So we, we went hip. Um, but it's actually moving forward in all sorts of uh, interesting ways. Because one of the things we haven't learned to be is a hip audience. I'm sorry? We haven't mm -hmm. learned to be a hip audience. Well, and, 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 and we never can be a hip audience, audience because you know, we're not wearing 16th century underwear or... <laughs> <laughs> um, on the whole, we try not to talk about performance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd like to pick up on this gentleman's point about it's appearing strange when we see a broken informed <coughs> performance. Um, in that, it, it seems to us stylized, and that Kind of, if, if we if we reverse that, then we can perhaps think about how opera production and direction has become the victim of I'm going to use some inflammatory language um, naturalistic theatre directing techniques. That we, we put demands on the singers that they should act naturally, when in actual fact it was always and continues to be a stylized form of performance. So uh, I would definitely advocate for the for the. <coughs> normalizing effect of natural <coughs> allow some of that operatic um, stylization to return. And then it's not so much about whether it's a concept of or a traditional production, but actually the mode of performance can be hit <coughs> in either of the it's perhaps about saying naturalism doesn't really fit in opera, and yet most of our directors are insisting on it. Which is why putting it in an insane insane asylum actually works, because the genre itself is mad in the first place. <laughs> 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 I would rather see it in an insane asylum, but still um, performed in a way that is operatic in the sense that uh, the movement and the gesture is stylized, rather than they're trying to be some sort of naturalist and attached to the text. <coughs> so it, it's, it's not quite one or the other. Following on that point, would, you, would the panel comment on that? Here, that it seems like the sound, as a, as a person who attends opera rather infrequently, nonetheless, you feel that the sound, um, opera's um, key point or primary point of performance, uh, technique or uh, performance, is somehow being jeopardized by this plight, plight for the sight. Um, kind of looking at the question that I did answer. <laughs> I was able to answer specifically, Professor Carter, that you presented in my presentation in terms of sight and sound. Um, when you were saying that once upon a time we would listen and we were more a hearing kind of audience, but now we're, there's all this visual presence here and sound takes second stage. Do, do the panel kind of feel that as kind of what's happening in opera, this determination to be hit? Because the hitness doesn't have anything to do with the change of the uh, compositional arrangement. Um, or the vocal, but to do with the set, the 
it's like naturalistic or realistic or what have you. Do you feel the sound is somehow being jeopardized? And also, yeah, my example with what you were saying, um, for example, for example, uh, a startup from Bali Shashatova a couple of years back uh, with Christina of Light, where she's singing this a beautiful aria to the moon, and you can't really concentrate on, on the music because she she's well, con she she's running across the stage, she's wet, she's smashing objects, and uh, sometimes the sound gets. Gets compromised because there are some when she's hiding behind some pillars or something, you just don't don't hear that you just see her well uh, maybe some enticing and some some somewhat enticing for especially for the male audiences in her see through wet dress uh, going all over uh, the stage, but then you just don't don't see that you just can't concentrate on on how beautiful the area is and how and how it merits from being performed. In stillness, actually, without smashing lamps and uh, other loud objects. I mean, you, you mentioned lighting. Uh, I, I think lighting and modern lighting is in part to blame for a lot of what's going on. Because if you just had candlelight, um, you had certain areas of the stage that would be permanently lit, mm -hmm. and other areas of the stage which would be permanently dimmer. And so you can move literally in and out of light. Mm -hmm. And once you move out of the light, then basically no one could see you. So you couldn't dash around. You couldn't dash around. You couldn't do that. So your Dakapa Aria singer could move into the lit part of the stage and then could move out of that. And you didn't see it anymore. So once you've got the possibility of total lighting in a stage or movable lighting in a stage or focused lighting here, there, and everywhere, all of a sudden you have to have more movement to fill the huge, the, the, the whole stage. Whereas um, with the candlelight, as I say, there, there, is, there, is pla there are lit places. Yeah. And the candles dim over time. Why, why do you think they're not sitting your finger? It starts in the morning, ends in the garden in the evening. <laughs> well, the candles are gone. You know, this is, I mean, this is, you know, it goes back to the Aristotelian duty, you, know? you know, start 12 hours of a day, start in the dawn, go in the evening, because the lights are going out in the end, you know? So, and the idea that the, the, the figure gets darker and darker and darker, as you go from the bright morning through the afternoon into the early evening in the garden, when people can't quite see each other anymore, we literally you can't see who's who because the candles are kind of guttering away um, uh, at, at, the end of their, at the end of their life. So I think lighting, total lighting, and the, the effects you can have so are clearly wonderful, but they do create a particular demand for a certain production. It does create a demand for a certain kind of production style. There is an expectation, of, and I think people expect but it's going to be a little bit like film. Oh, can't we just snap to the next scene? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. We have, you know. Um, Poggy and Bess, the brilliant brought up Poggy and Bess earlier. There is not enough scene change time yeah. to get out onto the island. It yeah. just, there isn't enough time. I can't yes. give you bar numbers. But there is simply not enough time. You've got a massive chorus, and you've got this beautiful lush music, and you really can't put in a repeat bar anywhere. Um, there's, it's, we all see it now, and we, we, we think it's going to happen instantaneously and magically, and it'll be um, seamless and perfect. Can I uh, return to that point about uh, modern lighting and the effects that it's having? There's a reverse effect technologically driven happening in TV and movies work at the moment, and the, one of the driving forces of that is the acuity of the cameras now, which are fantastic. They're more, they're, they're, their shutter speeds and their <coughs> digital speeds are much faster now than they were. So if we look at things like Ver Versailles at the moment, uh, was running, and then if you go back to Lord Four, look at all the arguments and bitching that were going on in the press about, I can't see anything, you know, because people are so used to the idea that everything was flooded out that way, that it's actually going the opposite direction. Some of the more really interesting uh, Albeit historical, figure uh, of camera, but uh, example of that, is that we're seeing this more and more now, and this requires the director or the camera operators to rethink how they're doing it. So, all this thing about direction, about directing the camera, but also where the lights, the couples of light are not, uh, is 
having to be re reimagined to understand how to make it work. And that's really exciting in the areas that I'm in, because I'm not in opera, I don't know. Um, but it's fantastic how we're starting to reinvent craft again, because we went through a terrible teri a period of digital flooding of everything. You know, because you do anything you want and then put it all in post-production. But they, we're moving more to a, a, a large amount of craft is there. And we're moving more towards, if you take examples of Nolan, the director in, in the movie, you know, uh, wanting to get back to what are called physical effects. You know, obviously. So it, I find it fascinating that there are things you know, crossing in, in 180 degree directions that are going on at the moment. But the, the, the camera question comes back to your very good question as well about sight and sound. I mean, you know, to what extent is HD, for example, HD movies, HD broadcasts of the net, um, actually destroying an ability to hear the music because you've got these camera close-ups all the time, so you're looking at the tears pouring down Violetta's face, and you're not actually hearing the tears that are being expressed through the music. I mean, your question about sound is, a, I think, a very powerful one. Very interesting. Whatever, what people think I'd love, I'd love to see that for the first time it shows up on a syllabus. Acting for the camera, obviously. And it will, no, it's coming. It's coming. It won't be long because right now they don't learn microphone technique. They don't learn anything that involves cameras. Um, they're acting for a venue that could be 4,000 people. More likely not at the age of 21, but by the, you know they're, they're hoping to be acting for a space that seats 4,000. And it is only a matter of time, given that we're now broadcasting with the HD everywhere. But I guess the, the, the subtext of your question is, are, are we losing all AURAL literacy? Yeah. I think are, we, are we losing oral literacy because of a kind of enlightenment, post-enlightenment emphasis on the visual? In I terms of you know, opera. In terms of opera. In terms of opera. I mean, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of very, it's this, uh, what is it, not postmodern, but postmodern, where it's merging with seat dramatic theatre performance, so it's becoming like musical theatre. <laughs> yeah. you know, the distinction is, well, it's just the ticket prices are more expensive than musical theatre. I mean, is it being, you know, pardon the term, but bastardized by this, uh, the, you know, this, this um, disregard of, this, of, the comp of the composition, of the, of the vocal technique, by semi-nude woman smashing glass. Smashing glass is a sound. It is a sound that will disrupt the sound of the written music, you know, compositional thing. So you're adding, you're adding, you know, avant-garde techniques to the composition there. That's music. And is that the role of historically informed performance? To get us back to just doing the sound, and then if we can have some yeah. paleo dancers with panniers and stuff like that, then, we're, then we'll be good too. But the, the, we're, we're going back to that. That when we go and see the, the hip performance, we're going to listen with still and moving curtains. Can I just go come back to that point earlier? The, in, in my world, I've noticed that when technique, new technology technique comes in, the art is la lags as it adjusts to it. What it does is it, it rushes to this. As a designer, I remember in the 70s, the full, of, the full color photocopy. And every bloody piece of work you ever saw in a, in a college or an art college was done in that particular way. And it took time for it to run actually through. This is the, I probably wasn't articulating properly earlier. We, there's a craving for craft. I don't know if there is in opera, but there's a craving for craft at the moment in, in um, certainly in television, and certainly in the, in the direction of movie making at the moment, uh, at the quality of it, if I can put it like that. And that means that it's, it's been kick-started in certain cases, we could actually do it. Remember what happened to the opera glasses? Anybody here knows about where opera glasses came from originally? It's interesting. It was like the Eiffel Tower, and it's put up, everybody hated it. And of course all the makeup that you would have seen, that was being used in opera, <laughs> and other, other production. As soon as the opera glasses came up, we were getting your HT issue. All of a sudden, you could see the pimples and suddenly, and the bizarre, as it would then appear bizarre, decor, uh, you know, um, makeup because 
at a distance, it looked absolutely fine, but it was there, and it just <laughs> looked absolutely ridiculous. And it took, I think there was, there was some broken at one stage, it was rather like the Christian draft or something, it was they smashed these opera glasses in Milan. Said, we don't want this, put it away. Don't bring them in anymore. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just draw a parallel with uh, one of the talks I went to yesterday? Sergio gave a really interesting talk about loud rock music. And, uh, you know, he showed pictures of, of, of the mixing desks in 1967 and the mixing desks in 1973. And it sounds very obscure, but actually what came out of it was that the, the art responded to the technology that was available. I mean, Jimi Hendrix couldn't have existed until the technology of the loud, you know, of the amplifiers and the, and the, and it reminded me of something I think I read about opera, which is that the way that the voices changed in 19th century Italy was partly a response to the bigger houses and the different instruments that the orchestras were using. I hope that's, I'm, I'm only a first year opera student, so I may have, you know, got this wrong, but I mean, you know, I thought at first I was just going to Sergio's talk because I like 1967 rock music, but actually it made me think about things that happen in opera, and just as the lighting changes will affect the way you produce things, so the technology of the sound affects the art, and I thought it was really fascinating, the two, you know, the parallels between the two. So are you advocating a hit performance of Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> <laughs> Every day, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> the technology that, that, that drove it, with which it was associated, sure. is the problem. Yes, sir, you have a question. Yeah, we're yeah, the sound question, uh, in the case of opera, maybe also the other class, and maybe also um, interesting to notice in the whole cocktail of, of how we appreciate sound, is that the specific architecture uh, in which opera plays take place. So can I consider not only what you were saying, mic positioning, but actually the kind of microphones we use, mm -hmm. how, how, what kind of material, uh, walls and holes, what kind of sound design are architects considering sound, uh, you know, yeah, that, all those things. Um, it would be interesting to compare that also in different time periods. How, how were people involved in construction of these buildings in the first place? Were thinking about these things? Well, you were still going to the place down to the E&O, which was not designed for opera at all. Mm -hmm. That house was not in any way, shape, or form. historically recreate acoustic environments, which you can do digitally. You know, you, you can create different acoustical spaces in, in, in using digital effects. And that, that starts getting very interesting. Can, can you recreate the sound of, you know, the Teatro San Cassiano in Venice in 1637, the acoustical environment in some kind of way? And what would happen if you then put performers in that specific acoustical environment and listen to them, and how would it work? That would be very interesting. That goes well, back to the 60s with the uh, the um, flying saucers that were put in, uh, in the other oh, top. Yeah. Yeah. Because acoutically it was an absolute mess <laughs> for everything. Yeah. The modelling that, just to, to, to make the point, how it was actually done was fascinating. Is It was a tiny uh, model, a hundredth of the size, with everything in a scale. The music was played in, yeah, a hundred times faster. Mm. It was then slowed down a hundred times. <laughs> And that, because it, the speed of sound yep. was, was important, and the materials were, and they could do that. And so they, using this analog technique, they were doing, they were changing and modifying things like that from 40 years ago. Yeah. Very interesting. Following on your point, Professor, um, 
when we talk about contemporary um, opera music, the, of the microphone and the, uh, the clip you showed us of the American Idol, for example, how, and back to this notion of craft, how, how, how much do you, you as educators feel that op current opera singers or students might not be able to actually fill that void without the mic, or how much influence the mic actually now plays on our notion of, oh, what an amazing, what an amazing voice. I mean, what if Maria Callas was, was a mic, would we, would we go, oh my God, blowing the speakers out of the auditorium, would we think, hmm, quite fragile. In what way do you think the mic has influenced, you know, our, our awe, our awe? I'm going to jump in here because my experience has been that in, in teaching young singers, and I'm talking 18 to 22, maybe 24, um, they're not being asked to fill a house that they can't fill. So they, when they build a new house, and I've, I'm going to use the example of Indiana University, because what they did was they took the, the anecdotally, of course, they took the plans of the Metropolitan Opera House, added six inches, and built it in the cornfields of Indiana. Fully hydraulic, fully, uh, fully trackable. The stage, you see this stage? There's a wagon there, there's a wagon there, there's a wagon here. Double layer pit, huge. You've got about 20 rows of audience. You've got three galleries. They're three rows deep. The back row is here. So what they did was, because it was an educational institution, they brought the back wall right forward. So they're not pushing to get their voices to the back of the house. They get to perform. They get the experience of working on a stage with a 110-foot um, grid. So they get the fear factor in a big way. Um, and, they, and they get all of the technology and everything that's supporting them, and the costumes, and the wigs, and the lighting, and all of this magic, but they're not pushing their voices. Yeah. And I can't imagine a single training institution for opera that wouldn't have something in place. And it might be the mushrooms, hanging mushrooms, or they're bringing a back curtain forward. But I can't see that that would ever happen. Yes. Um, so, and, and if they're getting mic training, they're not going to get in the opera department. They're going next door to the theatre. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that, just, that in itself is a problem. That's a, I mean, you're, yeah. Yeah, and just, just, point. Point. just out of interest sake, if you look at the Royal College of Music, they have a the Britain Theatre is specifically for the opera department. It's also a theatre that's on a grand scale, but it's a lot smaller. So the audience or the, the singers don't need to push their voices because they can't fill the space. So they get all the training of the staging and the lighting and the costumes and being so close to the audience, but it's not really showing their voices at all. So you still train in that way. I don't know if mic technique is a thing that needs to be incorporated into the training of young singers. Um, Everybody I know who's had to go into, where either you go to musical theatre and then you'll get some training. Yeah. If, if you sidestep, everywhere, for example, Phantom of the Opera, and I say that because I'm not calling it an opera, I'm saying it because it requires operatic technique and you are cast unless you have operatic training. Yeah. You learn it on the job. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. And, and you're expected to just pick it up, you show up with what you have in here, and then, then you'll learn as you go along. Yeah, so I'm ignorant. So it sets you up purposefully for. You know, I'm ignorant to most opera houses, so. Where opera is performed in that, so you're saying most operas are not mic. No mics, no. Oh, no. no. When you see, yeah, when you okay. see um, a, a, a stereo pair of microphones hanging down, what they're doing is they're feeding it to the dressing rooms. That's the sound oh, in your opera house. Okay. You're getting monitor feed right. wow. to the dressing rooms, maybe to somebody with a headphone who's going to do a backstage band no, or thing. Okay. But, but it's not the performance. No, no. Not, the, oh, okay. not even the background amplification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. None at all. Mm -hmm. So hence the strangeness of the hipness of the staging for the performance. It must be very, very odd in a sense because the, the, those are mics, or they are kind of they, those sounds become prominent to. Uh, the vocal technique and, and the, the transition. No, no, I appreciate what you're saying, but I mean, with um, forgotten your name. I'm sorry. Julia. Julia's example of of the, the singer crashing around on stage, <laughs> her semi nude state. It must be quite strange that the performers have to deal with all this additional sound, which might be mics on the stage itself, not her voice or the or or orchestra. But it's, it's just, so the hitness of it is is just the hitness of it. 
almost distorts the opera. Did you just for some reason you made me think of um, Carmen and uh, when she either plays castanets or whatever she does, she always does something, doesn't she? Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes she gets a play and she smashes it and she gets the two parts and she hits those together. Yeah. Um, but that, it, it, anything like that is supposed maybe to be the rehearsal process. You just, you, you just, it becomes part of it as you're doing it. Okay. So maybe that, this, this <laughs> but I think in respect of voice, uh, hit performances must be good for singers, no? because they, in hit performances they don't have to, to shout as loud, because the instruments are uh, not so loud, because there's a huge technological uh, development uh, in respect to the instruments. Instruments got violent. And that's why opera singers, uh, for example, in Wagner Opera, have, or in Verdi operas, have to sing much more louder today because of the orchestra, because the orchestra is much more louder. And if the conductor doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't silence the <laughs> down the, the orchestra, and most conductors won't do it because they want to show off the orchestra. And uh, then they have to, to, to sing much more loud than a singer in the 19th century, than a singer in the worst time, uh, for example. It's interesting because you, you made me think also about the, the hit comment and, and the, the concept of having a contemporary setting and staging on a historically informed musical mm -hmm. production. And very frequently, people who are trained in historical performance are very adept at singing contemporary. Yeah. A lot of it to do with extended technique, but a lot of it also is that you might not, you might have a smaller instrument mm -hmm. and the flexibility to mm -hmm. be an old contra or something, mm -hmm. and that will work really nicely with a microphone mm -hmm. because you don't, you're not reliant on, on you know, a rocky rope mechanism. You're working in a small, boutique kind of way, and then you stick a microphone on that, and it, and it fits quite, it's merged quite nicely. But it's also do, to do with the age of singers. I mean, I mentioned um, Anna Gottlieb, you know, sings Barbarina at the age of 12, mm. sings Pamina at the age of 18. Well, she basically stopped singing by her mid-twenties. She mm. wasn't singing on the stage anymore. Now, mm. that was in part because she got married and therefore it wasn't appropriate for her to not sing on the stage, but in part it was because her voice just, I mean, her, basically her voice had gone because you have these untrained voices <laughs> that, you know, give their all for a, a very short period of time and then they're gone, they can't protect their vocal cords in ways that modern singers are trained to protect their vocal scores, and therefore modern singers have a much longer singing career. If they have, yeah. If they have. <laughs> Sometimes it uh, is the case with modern singers yeah. because they have to sing so loud, and if they don't uh, choose their own schedule, mm -hmm. it can happen. There's a big, there's a big push to, to be out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a big push to be out there doing your career. Yeah. As soon as possible. Yeah. That's what you do. I need to pay that my student loan. Get yeah. me out there. And you, if, you, if you're male, you better get yourself a good part time job because you won't be able to afford it. Yeah. Most of the time. But also, you're, you're not singing those roles. The whole profession is different. I mean, you know, in, 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 in Verdi's case, you know, you hire the team of singers for the season. They sing five or six operas within the season, night after night. Different operas, night after night. And so you've got the same singers recurring in these different roles. You've got the people going to the opera house every night, seeing these same singers in these different roles. I mean, you know, in the case of when they premiered Rigoletto, they were playing Lucia di Lammermoor, they were playing um, some other obscure Italian opera night after night. Lucia something Rigoletto, Lucia something Rigoletto, with the same singers. Mm -hmm. The same is, singers. Is Germany the only place that has the press position concept still functioning? Mm -hmm. Are there other is it only Germany that does that concept of we hire somebody, they work for us, they do all our stuff? Yeah. Certainly in the US that doesn't happen. Yeah. I don't know that it happens here. Yeah. You couldn't make it work in the US, I don't think. Well, and also you're on a 10 day staging, yeah. in, out, get it up there, go and play. We're gradually reaching the end of our hour. <laughs> Has anyone got any final thoughts, comments? In response to the glorious two days we've spent together, anyone from here? Anyone from there? Can I make one point? 
from the rest of the uh, uh, parts of the world that I work in, watch out very, very carefully in uh, of how you amplify sound in the future. Uh, I'm designed. And I work five to ten years ahead on electronic development. And what will come <coughs> is on the fly modification to tuning, and you've already heard this dreadful crap over the last five, six years for me in uh, popular music often, where the practitioner has virtually no skill whatsoever that they're modified. This on the fly is absolutely the case. So watch it, you can. <laughs> <laughs> All your great training and keeping your voices and everything won't come to a hell of being uh, once this stuff kicks in. I just wanted to express on the account that I hope everybody is soon come. My admiration for Jay and for the work she's put into the this country. And uh, thank, you, thank you for inviting me to speak. It was my most nervous performance ever speaking. <laughs> and um, yet long may this uh, conference continue and flourish. Yes, yeah. <laughs>